everyone. So, <laughs> my name is Pedro Rosso. I guess that we are familiar with most of you. Um, for some of the people that is not familiar with my company, my company is called Smart JSP. We have been um, helping the IDMPR community and doing collaboration with a lot of different projects in different places. Um, we have started to attend this conference in Krefeld. I guess that was the, the last time that we were going, getting together. Um, uh, my company essentially is focused today, I, I will talk to you uh, about that, uh, mostly in integration. So IDMPR is one of our strengths for sure. But usually we combine a lot of different tools for our customers. Today our focus is about an interesting plugin that we have been developing for a while that is called a Smart Integrator. So this is an OSGI plugin that enables IDMPR to connect other applications um, and we'll see the different business cases and the motivations that they are related. This is more or less the topics that we will be covering in these sessions. Um, we will be having a space also for questions and, and so on <laughs> if you have it. I will, um, I will, I, I have uh, a detailed demo um, and I will show you also the documentation that we have for this release that is pretty detailed step by step installation and something like that so you will see that one working. Um, a bit of my background, um, I started uh, as a system engineer uh, and we, we happen to study in the same university with Carlos. We used to be <laughs> students there in Colombia. Mm, I have a master's degree uh, when I decided to start my own company and I used to live in Canada for six years. I'm, a, I'm an originally from Colombia and there. I have been working for a long time in big organizations as a technology architect before uh, deciding uh, to focus all my attention in open source. So I have a strong background in IBM, in Oracle, and Pricewaterhouse methodologies practice, things like that. Um, but that's not my focus anymore. So essentially the idea is that some of the practices, some of the methodologies that we use for our company, they are coming from some of those markets, but we are focused in the middle market more or less. So those companies that they wanna be big, but they don't have the big budget. <laughs> I guess that you're facing the same challenges sometimes. So um, in terms of our company, as I mentioned to you, we are focused in integration. Um, we are trying to narrow the space of that integration every year so that we are giving more value to, to our customers. And for sure, uh, we are focused in open source. So essentially, we are specialized to help the people to go out from Oracle, to go out from Microsoft. That's one of our focus here. Uh, an interesting topic, and that closed my introduction here, are some of the coming releases. In previous um, conference, uh, we have been sharing some information about the retail solution that we have, like the points of sales, things like that. Um, but um, this year, it will be an, an important year for us with the community because we will be performing a lot of releases. We are planning to have three big releases this year. Uh, I'm not sharing that information in this conference because that's not the focus, but it's just to that if you are interested to have some things new for retail, if you are interested to have, for example, solutions and plugins for agriculture, um, for healthcare, we'll be releasing that one in the next two or three months. They will be coming with plugins, with documentations, with tutorials, videos that we have been working, some of them during the pandemic, some of them in the last year. Um, I guess that we are lucky that this year, finally, some of the um, um, agreements of privacy or something with our customers, they allow us to share all this in the open source site. So that will be interesting for you if you are interested in that. So today, our focus is integration. I won't be talking more about that. So what is the business use case that is driving this, this plugin? Essentially, initially, maybe six years ago, more or less, or, or more time, in the retail industry, there was a, a, a requirement for replication, which is kind of similar to the replication provided by the ERP. You have one ERP here, you have another ERP here, and you wanna have some information, let's say for the products, price list or something that is com coming from your main branch to another branch in another city, okay? But as the time has been evolving, this requirement now is more sophisticated. So our customers now, they wanna be selective. 
is uh, okay. I want to replicate my information, or I want to uh, um, synchronize my information between my main branch in Istanbul and another branch that I have here in Manama, but I just want to replicate the price list. I don't want to replicate the whole thing because that's the, the only thing that is changing. Um, other customers, they want to say, you know what, I want to replicate that data, but not in real time because um, I have another branch in Africa and they don't have full availability of internet all the time. So they can synchronize prices every two weeks as a batch job, so it's not real time. So now they are talking about uh, synchronous, synchronous, I can decide which table, okay? And that creates an issue in the ERP because now you want to replicate an invoice. And if you want to replicate an invoice, uh, is the information of your business partner up to date? Is the information of your product up to date? So you need to go to the Active Dictionary and look what are the dependencies of that object. And if they are asking to replicate an invoice, you need to have like an, an, a smart guy that is checking, you know what, I need to replicate the information of the business partner, of the price list, blah, 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 and send the whole package to that user that is asking for that replication. If internet is not available, okay, I need to catch this information locally, and as soon as the, uh, the internet availability is again available, I will be sending that information. So that's more or less, so here we have some of the main things that we have in mind. So we have been evolving this one. So it's an OSGI plugin. Uh, currently, it's working in IDEM PF9. We will be releasing this version with version 10. Up, uh, we are just testing in version 10 over the next week. And we are using um, the main tool that we are using, the platform that we are using, is Apache Kafka. So, uh, and this is like the fourth version of our initial solution. So we started with a replication. In, in our initial versions of the replication, we were using um, uh, MQ, uh, Apache MQ. We were using Rabbit MQ. Uh, after that, we were using Apache Cassandra. We were sharing some of that development in the last conference. But one of the, uh, of the main motivations behind using Apache Kafka, I, I will be sharing more about that later on. So in terms of design, in terms of the architecture, what are the main strengths that we are looking for? So we want to have different options for a synchronous mode that are less painful for the developers. So, and what I'm talking about less painful thing is I don't want to deal with web hooks. So I was checking the demonstration of um, Mar Marcelino from Brazil, for example. So if you want to simulate a synchronous uh, behavior manually, which is what they were doing in Dart, is painful. So you need to deal with a lot of web hooks here, you need to do manual thing here, three try, that, that one works. So the whole thing to have an asynchronous uh, connector is that the connector is doing that work for you. So if the network is going down, that message is in some secure place and he will retry that one and will send that information for you. So that, that's one of the things that we wanna say. The second important thing here is there is a new um, trend and, and there is a new, uh, let's say, a style of architecture that now we have that is event-oriented architecture. So the whole idea is that now I have a massive amount of information that is coming from sensors, for the small devices, for mobile phones, things like that. So if we are performing integration and we are trying to do that manually, or programmatically, so just writing the integration and an REST API and the, doing things like that, is too time consuming for big integrations. For a small integration specific things, it makes sense. But for something really big, if you wanna scale, you wanna have something that is more flexible, you wanna send information for a massive amount of customers. You don't know if the people that is consuming your message is a mobile device, if it is another ERP, maybe it's a Microsoft, I don't know, I don't know. But I wanna be sure that my message is delivered if the network is not available, the platform is in charge of that, and once the information is sent, I'm taking care about two important topics here. One, performance. 
when we are talking about web services, one of the concerns when we are talking about integration is performance. Not all the web services are scalable. So sometimes, because the, the nature of the protocol, the HTTP protocol, when we are requesting things, transforming those things in the JSON objects that we used to use in REST web services, they are not optimized for, for, for high performance and especially also for asynchronous um, scenarios. So scalability and performance are two important things that Kafka help us because essentially the transportation protocol in Kafka is designed for high performance. Some of the things that we are looking for is to simplify security management, for example. If you see an integration with REST web services, like we have been seeing in some of the previous conference, we, as a developer, we are dealing with tokens. That's an issue. We shouldn't be doing that. We should delegate security to the infrastructure. If I already have a VPN, if I already have a tunnel between my server and a remote server in any cloud or something like that, my life should be easier. So I'm assuming that I am protected from a security tunnel that's a problem of the infrastructure. Sorry if I say that, but it's my problem as a developer is to create value, is to focus my attention on the information that I'm sending back and forth, but transportation of, of that data, security of that data, performance of that data should be delegated to these kind of products that they are specialized in that way. So th this is another approach that is focused in this one. The fourth motivation that is really important here is this event-oriented architecture is coming with a new trend about the streams. For most of us that we have been working in ERP, the information should be in a database. That's the traditional way. So we are processing information, we are going, we are creating queries, we have bottlenecks, and, and the best thing that we can do to deal with performance is maybe tuning is maybe adding more processors, maybe adding more memory. But there is a new trend, there is a new way to manage massive amount of people in memory. Memory is not expensive anymore. So we can manage a lot of people, a lot of information in memory with a huge performance and at the same time allowing our customers those remote customers that they want to take the information from our system to create queries, what we call now data lakes. So we can build on top of these JSON objects or on top of this information that we're sending to Kafka, we can create a data layer and we can allow these guys to play with that information in memory. So we, we have better performance, we, we don't have that problem anymore in our site. We can delegate the problem. So those are the things that we have here. For sure, we want to have something that is neutral in terms of formats. So JSON used to be the most popular format to transport information in a neutral kind of approach, but it's not the most effective when we are talking about data quality because we need to deal with data validations. So this platform, Kafka, allow us to use the new generation of data formats that will be replacing JSON soon. So some of those formats, uh, we are talking about Abro and about other formats that they have what they call like an, a data schema. So you can define validation rules, you can define data typing, those kind of things that they are validated in the source of the integration. So no one is touching IDEMPIR if they are not sending valid IDs in terms of the size, in terms of the data type, in terms of the data values, for example, I can send some values that those are the values that you have to use. If you don't have that information validated in the source, don't touch my connector. I don't have to validate those things. So those, again, might be provided and maybe managed in this case between Apache Kafka and some of the providers of these Avro things. So that's kind of the vision and that's why I mentioned this one here. And the last two topics, I already mentioned that before, the selective scope. We want to take advantage about uh, how intelligent is the active dictionary in terms of the data model. So we know that in terms of the database, 
there are some uh, integrity rules. So we know some reference between one table and this table and this table. But the Active Dictionary have additional information about who is depending on which information, so something like that. So we have been combining the two things, and every time that we are sending an object, we perform a validation and, and we apply something like I mentioned before. If I am replicating information about a purchase order or something, I try to detect, okay, this one is depending on this one, this one, or this one, so I send five objects, not just one. So the person has everything that they need to perform the integration depending on that. And the la latest one for sure is to be sure that we are using open source um, technologies to be sure that this is sustainable in the time. So in a kind of simplistic uh, approach, uh, we are planning to have these remote um, applications. So it doesn't really matter the item pair distribution in this case. Uh, we have been testing this one with version 9, with version 11 of Heidenpeer, just vanilla Heidenpeer, but we have been testing also with Logilite, so that, that works without any problem. We don't have any dependency in this moment from, from that sense. The customer or the consumer of this uh, plugin can be any um, API client of Kafka, which essentially is a massive amount of options that we have in the market. So it's not just a Java client, it can be a C++ client, it can be PHP, Python. So there is a massive amount of APIs and connectors available in the Kafka market that they can consume the information that we will be publishing in Kafka, which is interesting to open the doors for anyone. So as I mentioned to you before, this was the evolution. So some of the technologies that we have been working before, and essentially the focus now is, okay, we wanna send information, but we wanna receive information <coughs> also um, from our ERP to any other application that is available there. Sometimes asynchronous, sometimes synchronous. So it's good. If they have web services, it's good. If they don't have web services, they can use an Apache client. I will show you uh, how simple is an, an, an Apache Kafka client in a mobile app. I will show you now at the end of the demo. So you can see how easy it is, 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 is less work than a web service client, for example. And some of the interesting approach that we were trying to optimize here is one of the problems that we have when we are dealing with web services integration is that um, we are depending of the structure of the, uh, when we are creating the objects. For example, if we have an idempier object, like an, an invoice, we need to transform that object, that PO object, typically the persistent object in, in idempier, we need to transform that object in something that seems to be a JSON object. Um, so if we perform that one in an automatic way, we are generating a lot of garbage. So really, it's a JSON object, but you are sending a massive amount of information that your end user, they don't understand because he's not an expert in an ERP and because they don't need it. So something that we have here, and is one of the good optimizations that we have with the smart integrator, is we have a way to filter fields that my consumer, they don't need. So if I wanna send information about my business partner, I can send just the mandatory fields that are required in the active dictionary to that user. So he won't be receiving the whole PO object with a lot of information that they won't need. It's just a really small JSON object with the basic information. In the other side, if they wanna send information to me, I am asking just the mandatory fields, and I can offer an additional service to them. It's they are not familiar with sequences. They are not fami familiar sometimes with codes. They are more familiar with the descriptions. So something that we include in this integrator version is that we can map values and IDs. So if my consumer is familiar, for example, with a category of a product, he can include in my JSON object the category name or something, and we will look for that category and we will uh, find the ID. Similar to some of the functionality that we have in the imports and the exports that they are available in IDMPR for sure. Uh, some of the advantages in the implementation, and this is coming from the previous implementation of the integrator and the replication, 
we are using reactive frameworks. So that means that we are taking advantage about the new technologies that they are consuming less resources. So we have reactive frameworks monitoring the resources, monitoring the changes. They don't really consume. It's, it's not the typical while that they are checking <laughs> all the time. So they are really liked in that. Um, they are really simple to be used. So they are part of the internal implementation as well. As I mentioned to you, we have two different ways to manage the JSON objects. So this first version that we have is, is managing everything with JSON. Um, but, but the idea is I can specify in the, in the active dictionary, I want to have simplified objects. So all my JSON objects now, they are really simple ones. So I send information back and forth, so it's simpler for the user. And the, the um, plugin is replacing some of the IDs with the descriptions. So it's really easy for them uh, in, in, to manipulate and to see the information. Because in other way, we are sending just the PO object with all the IDs or something. Yeah, it's, it's not really easy. You will need a developer to be working with that. Um, I mentioned that we are detecting dependencies and we are catching the messages. So when you are installing this um, plugin in your IdenPeer instance, we are creating another schema. So we are creating a schema. I will show you that one in Postgres. And in that schema, we are creating maybe three tables. And those are kind of the standard Postgres tables that we use temporarily to put your JSON message in case that your internet connection is not available. So that's really helpful because you can see the information, you can see that it's secure, it's really easy to back up the information. If you are losing, for example, your internet connection for two or three days, you are completely sure that your information is stored and that you can see the message and it's really easy to administrate them from that perspective. Okay? Um, interesting things. Until this moment, we are talking about sending and receiving objects. So that sounds like a uh, messaging, a standard messaging approach with some performance improvement and things like that. But the real additional value of Kafka is that we can build on top of these objects that now they are in Kafka. One of the advantage is that we can persist these objects in Kafka, that doesn't really mean that they are going to a database. I, I can do that. But the essential is we can keep these objects in Kafka all the time if you want. It's like an, a replication in memory that you can keep. And you can model what we call materialized views. <coughs> they are similar to the database views, but they are taking the objects in Kafka. And now you have virtual tables in Kafka, and you have a KSQL language that you can use to query your objects in memory. And remember, they are in memory. They are not in the hard disk. So you can do a lot of things with a good performance. You can create collections. You can generate things from that sense. So Kafka is getting a bit popular because of this, because for some people, it's like an adieu, a new data source that is not is removing a bit of the complexity of the data model of the ERP. So my replicated objects are a subset of the data that I have in my ERP. And maybe that are, they are good enough for other goals that your customer has. So it's about integration but it's also about building data that is available for your customer if they want to build something else in that. In terms of the integration per se, and just to finish all this topic about Kafka, we have a lot of flexibility. We are talking about consumers. So everyone that have C++, C Sharp, Python, Java, JavaScript, there are more than 20 programming languages and platforms where Kafka is available with, with a consumer. And it's not just a consumer and a producer API. That's the first level of integration with Kafka. The second level is what we call the Kafka streaming. So there is another technology. And this Kafka streaming is like an, an additional um, layer on top of the streams theory that we have in the Java enterprise. If you remember when uh, the streams were coming uh, to the Java enterprise, um, essentially, we are trying to model again in memory uh, 
additional logic so we can play with the information. You, we can take these objects, create collections of objects in memory, we can sort, we can transform, we can do a lot of things. Kafka streaming allows us to take those objects really easy from the consumer side and play with that information and create information that gives a lot of value to my consumer. So it's not just about basic integration anymore. It's I can take information, I can consume information from Idempure from four or five different objects. I can play with those objects. I can create a materialized view. I can create a SQL. And on top of that, I can do a lot of things in my business. And, and that saves a lot of time for a normal developer. And it's not consuming the performance of my ERP because it's not touching the database. I'm not going to the database. So I can play with that. And the last technology, which is kind of a hybrid. This is not 100% open source. I have to be transparent with you. Apache Kafka uh, includes, one, one of the main players of the Apache Kafka community is called Confluent. So Confluent is the main company uh, behind Kafka. It's not the only one. But Confluent is the main um, provider of the Kafka connector. So there is a whole community uh, providing connectors for specialized things. So for example, SIP connector for Kafka, Oracle connector for Kafka. <laughs> that one already applies. So if you already have a Kafka server, you can send information, you can take information from Nidenpeer, and if your customer have Oracle, I guess that they have money to spend <laughs> in, an, in an Oracle a connector for Kafka. The interesting thing here is once we have our objects in Kafka, they are in a different world. Now I can ask to my customer if they have a Salesforce kind of thing. It's okay, you can get a connector for Salesforce or something. And similarly that we were talking before, about delegate that complexity. So I'm not expecting to be a Salesforce expert, something like that. My expectation is, okay, I can send information to the SIP. So just bring that connector to me and I can send information back and forth in, in that. That's more or less, okay? So what we are expecting to have at the end of the day is that uh, this uh, black <laughs> group of circles, I imagine that is my Kafka server. I'm expecting to have many connectors so that open the space to consume and also to produce information to a lot of people. In our place, let's say that we are identified that we are in that corner, in that case, we are able to produce information and to simplify. In my case, as leading this project, we were checking and it was not convenient for us as a community to create a connector because as I mentioned to you, it's like an, a hybrid model where Confluent is providing some of that information. So it's a bit proprietary and a bit open source. So we decided, no, we, we will keep this implementation of the smart integrator with the basic API. So we are fully uh, protected, let's say. Uh, so we are not depending of anything that is proprietary and it will be a connector that it can be used for any integration in the future. So, but for other people, maybe it makes sense to create that connector. So. Um, the last topic that I will be sharing with you is related with two different demos. I will be sharing uh, how is the process and we will be reviewing how is the installation process of the plugin, the main structure, the main capabilities. That's, that's mostly focused in Idempure. I will show you like a um, consumer console in Kafka so we can see how Idempure is sending JSON objects uh, to the consumer and we can simulate how we can inject information to Idempeer using a simple business partner, using a simple product immediately in, in two consoles. After that, I will be finishing with the mobile uh, simulations and you will see that one working as well. So a typical Kafka client, in this case, this will be like my last topic, can use different approach as I mentioned to you, but this one that I will show you is an interesting part as well because we were suffering in the past with mobile devices. So we have been working uh, with React, we have been working with Dart, <laughs> and in the last one year and a half, we decided there should be another way to do these things and keep the things simple in maintenance. So that might be useful for you, it's not the topic of this meeting, but that's part of the things that I will be sharing at the end. So let's move to the documentation, which is here. 
So every release that we are trying to share with the community um, used to have an installation manual in some of the retail, uh, for example, solutions that we have. We have installation manual, we have user manual. Um, if, if the solution is really big enough, sometimes we have different manuals, like in a quick start. <laughs> and after that, you have the reference manual, something like Carlos mentioned yesterday, depending of, of the objectives. So in this case, I want to just focus the attention here in my bookmarks area. So here we have, in case that your uh, uh, programmers or developers, they are not familiar, we have here uh, a really quick review of the capabilities, what are the contexts, the different modes of operation that I just mentioned before. We can use, um, we can offer full asynchronous mode, or if you wanna have synchronous because you have good connectivity, you can do it. Um, this integration, it can be performed uh, not just one-to-one. -one. We can define a server, and we can define mainly consumers, taking advantage about the Kafka. It's kind of similar to ActiveMQ in the past, where you have a, a subscription kind of model. Yeah, so we can define something like that. Um, the only prerequisites that we have in this moment, that's more or less the step-by-step -step process that we are following. Um, you need to have access to your item peer, um, in this case, super user or system access, because you will need to install some of the information, some of the system configuration parameters. In this case, um, you need to be familiar with the tables that you are planning to replicate. So more or less clear in your mind, okay, I wanna replicate just this table or, or this other table or something like that. The idea here is not to replace the whole database. And, and I, I just to, I wanna clarify that uh, because the database itself provides really good options to replicate the whole thing and it's more efficient. So here is more for a specific use cases, subset of information that you wanna do and you wanna keep good control. Um, for example, sometimes one of the main issues is the network bandwidth. That's not really common maybe in Europe and, and in US, but in Latin America or in Africa, uh, it's really a big issue. <laughs> See, sometimes you, you are paying more and you're, you have a top uh, that you cannot, a maximum uh, bandwidth that you cannot reach. So you, you need to have control about that. Okay, so it's good if you are familiar with some kind of database scripting, but it's, it's just enough to apply a SQL, uh, a SQL script. So if you are not an expert in that, you can work with <coughs> any uh, uh, database administrator or something because we will need to apply some scripts because we are creating something in the database for sure. Other than that, we have here some of the main things. So the installation is really easy. Um, we have uh, this repository. I will show you this one working. I have a um, Fedora environment. And in my case, it's running in a virtual Appliance, let me, I unlock this, good. So this is my repository, I'm not sure if, ah yeah, it, you can see it. So this is the structure of the replicator. We are trying to follow good practices. So I just wanna focus the attention in the main folders. So we have everything that is related with SQL scripts and they are isolated, let me show you. That's more clear. Thank you. So we have different package for the different components of the plugin, so you can see that. So everything, for example, that is related strictly with Kafka, um, it's in different folders in case that you wanna isolate that complexity to your developers. Um, some of the interesting things here is that because we are focusing performance, uh, we were trying to, oh, we were testing some of the serializer, for example, for JSON. So we are using some of the Google serializer that they are really, really good transforming some of these uh, objects. So we are trying to, to have some of the best components of the libraries that help us to have the best performance in, in terms of that. This is a standard OSGI uh, component. Essentially, um, we have divided some of the package properly. We are following the standard building with Maven. And as I mentioned before, with the documentation and with the installation that we have here. Um, a sec. Yeah. 
here essentially we are describing we have the SQL folder um, we have like three or four uh, SQL scripts they are really simple they have a sequence you, you need to apply them after that in as a system administrator you will be applying two or three uh, two packs uh, this is something that we need to improve so it's performing in an automatic way when maybe it's starting the, the plugin that's maybe the only thing that we need to add but some of the two packs are included here they are step by step blah blah blah, blah. once you have your two packs apply it to the identifier environment you can deploy the plugin as you apply or deploy any of these ones using your uh, console and once you have that one ready essentially um, we you will have some additional system configuration available in your identifier environment so the most important is this one that is called sync tables so it's a collection it's a list that you can add all the tables that you want using the exact name that you have in the active dictionary so you can add here requests you can add uh, invoices whatever you want is is flexible enough for you on top of that uh, there are some global settings that we have al available here there is a table with a summary so um, you can define configuration per tenant so if you have uh, many tenants in your uh, item peer um, you can include different policies for that replication so for this one I want to have a small uh, objects for this one I want to have big objects this one is server side this one is blah, blah, blah. so that's something that is supported by tenants so all, most of this um, uh, system configuration can be created uh, by default is created for you for the first deployment so um, you can externalize that's the common pattern uh, Kafka it doesn't have to be in the same server in in my demonstration Kafka is running in the same server but usually it's in an isolated server it, it doesn't consume a lot of resources so any Linux distribution work with Kafka you just need a basic JDK and on top of that you have a basic Kafka installation because we are using the simplistic integration with Kafka which is consumer and producer we are not using all the sophisticated stuff that Confluent is selling for some of the people in that. What else is important? You will be defining if your node is a server, if your node is a consumer, you can define some of those things. Here, what I mentioned before, you will be defining, I want to have simple objects. So please do the work for me. <laughs> Clean the PO objects for me and send, or if I am receiving information, complete the objects for me and that will simplify my life. I will show you what that really means in that. Here you define um, the Kafka topic. It's like the queue, uh, let's say, in Kafka that we are defining. Um, so we have different queues for the information that we are sending, the information that we are receiving. And we are also keeping track about what is happening with those messages. So as soon as I deliver a message from my local database, um, and marking the information and deleting the information but I also have the capability to leave the information in my cache if for auditing purposes for example if you want so that is also supported in that in terms of the modes you want to mention here so you will see that we have the different scenarios for the integration um, also some additional information if you want to resell the whole thing you were doing some testing so there are some things that are just limited for the admin of the platform that you can do things. For example, if you wanna perform a full um, um, a start of your uh, synchronization, that's really common for points of sales. Mm -hmm. So you wanna replicate products, you wanna replicate price list, um, maybe three or four tables more. But the first time you wanna send everything because you wanna be sure that, that the next day they have all the information up to date. So that's something that is supported here for those kind of, of, of customers, more or less. So that's more or less what is available here. Here we are talking about the Git repositories that uh, I'll be sending the, the full release. We'll be sending that one the next week for the whole community because we are finalizing the testing. But it's just for you to know that we, it will be coming with this, um, with this documentation as well. So let's talk a bit and let's play a bit with the, with, with the, with the plugin. So in this environment that I'm working, uh, any question? No? Okay, good. So in this environment, um, this is an IBM Peer 9 environment. Um, I have everything running here. 
and I have two consoles. On my left side, this is a consumer. So whatever I will be doing in my item peer, for example, if I am changing anything in my business partner, if I'm just changing anything in my products, those are the two tables that I configured here. I will see here my JSON objects <coughs> that I'm receiving. If I wanna inject, if I wanna produce something that I wanna inject to my ERP, I can do this one here. So those two uh, windows, those two tools, they are provided by Kafka. So Kafka provides you like an, a generic consumer and a generic producer. That's what I'm using here. Um, so we will see this one really easy. So in my instance, this is my local instance. This is my item here. <coughs> and it's interesting because I am using a Logilite distribution in, in version 9 in this case for, for the demo. It's, it's really like an vanilla with some kind of demo data and, and just my local thing with the smart retail, but we don't have any sophisticated things other than the, the, the plugin installed from this case. So I have a product. I can choose any product. This is a generic that I provided. And any time that I'm changing any information here, let's say that this is number nine, um, you can look in this part of the screen that as soon, as soon as I save this one, I'm sending information to that guy. So this information that I'm receiving here in the left side of the screen, let's take it. And let's put this one in a format that we can read that easily. So I will be using this tool. This is a JSON viewer <laughs> that help us uh, to see that JSON object in a more human uh, way to do it. This is a simplified object for a product, in, no, for a business partner in this case. And um, you can see in this case that we are not using all the fields that are usually are part of a PO in item peer. So we are removing some of the things. So <coughs> here, this, this, this is what the Active Dictionary considers that is mandatory for one transaction. That's one point. The second point, you can notice that some things have been replaced, some of the IDs have been replaced for, for the value that we manage, so that will help our consumers. So. They, they can see or they can manage. For example, product category is not the ID of the product category in this case. Um, we can do that a lot of times. Uh, that's something that we can configure in, in the Active Dictionary later on uh, with the demo that we will be creating. But essentially the idea is that we can deliver this object now with some additional information that it help my consumer to understand that one easily. And if they want to send that information, modify it, for example, to me, um, they can use the same information. They can use the same uh, text or something like that. So they, not, they, they don't need to be 100% familiar with that. That's something that won't be required in the future once we have Abro instead of JSON objects. Because with Abro, that should be available in the consumer side. So in the consumer side, all these rules, some of these ideas or something, we can update that one in an Abro registry, like in a centralized registry that will be done doing that work um, for us. In, in a similar way, that, that's coming from the ERP to the outside. If I want to inject something, I can take, I was preparing like an, a demo, dummy product. So this is a simple product. We just add to a, our standard JSON. Here is like an, a table name uh, because we want to have uh, within the meshes of Kafka, we want to have the name of the table to identify easier what are, what are the, the different objects, what is the source of the object, so the destination of that object. But this is a regular product with a simplified approach. You can see that uh, still I need uh, some of the fields mm -hmm. and some of these fields uh, I, I was in, in intentionally I was using a couple of fields that that we were customizing for this example so it's not just your basic um, fields that they are coming from the core but if you are creating additional fields if you are creating additional tables if they are managed by the active dictionary this uh, plugin is taking that information <coughs> from the active dictionary and is creating this form for you 
it's really important to understand that the approach that we were taking and that's based in our experience is that when we are creating these JSON objects before creating and before consuming the JSON objects we are transforming the POs in maps in Java and the advantage to transform these JSON objects in maps is that the names and the access to the fields is easier for the developers. Because in other way, we will need all the time the data objects or the DTOs that we create in Java to, to have that. So that's a common issue for developers that if they don't, if they don't have the latest version of the Java objects, uh, when they are performing serialization or things like that, uh, you might be in trouble. So, so we are creating this one as a Java map, and so it's easier for manage later form for them. So I can take this one that I have here, and just copy and paste, and come back here to my, uh, my producer. Before I'm doing that, just want to validate quickly that in my product, I guess it was this one, yeah. I just have available in the screen 36 and 37, the last two numbers. Those are the ones that I'm checking here. So I will be injecting a new one. So let me just refresh the screen. So I'm sure that I just have those two guys available there. So now I will be injecting in my consumer this guy. And we can go back and we can see two things. The first one is we try to be uh, developer friendly. So in the console of Eclipse, you will see <laughs> what you are receiving in the debugging. Okay, I'm receiving this JSON object. Just in case something is invalid, something is wrong, something, you will see that. And this in one, uh, it said, okay, a PO object was created. This is the number of the PO object. So I can go back to Idempeer, refresh this guy and I will see. Uh, a sec. Yep. Yep. And let me check it here. Ah. I guess it's 38. Yep. Ah, let's double check. Yeah, is this one? Ah, yeah, it's because it's this number is ME product. I'm using the wrong number, sorry about that. I was in business partner and I was using the, the wrong. It's this one. Mm -hmm. So we used to have 36, 37, and now that I refresh this, I will have 38. Yeah, that's the one that we just inject to, to these guys, okay? So we have the two ways integration working here. This is the simplistic way I'm doing just from the console, I can do it from any customer. But the last part, I just wanna have a quick check here. So I just need three or four minutes more for the mobile part. Is that okay, the timing? Ah, oh, sorry about it. Yeah, so I, I just focus in this part and, and that's all. So if, if you wanna see this one working from a mobile uh, application, and I just finished with this. Sorry about that. Is, this is a Visual Studio Code uh, with Open Java FX and Glue on Mobile. Um, this is Java. I'm not changing the programming at all. It's just Java. Uh, and I just want to show you quickly that this is a consumer in Kafka, which is really simple. You get access to a simple Kafka API configuration here on the top. So you are defining, I want to be connected with my topic. I want to be connected. I have some serializer because you already have the Java knowledge in the server side. It's really easy for you to create this one in the client side. The serializer is the same. The object description is the same. You don't need to create <coughs> things in JavaScript. You don't need to do things in TypeScript. You don't need anything like that. So that's available for you. So the general idea, is that you have a simple connection, you will be retrieving that information really easy here, it's pure Java code. If you wanna produce information, it's kind of similar. Uh, so this is assuming that you are not familiar with IDMPR at all, or something like that. And once you have that one uh, ready to go, in this case we are using Maven to integrate everything, 
Open Java FX is using the new technology of Graal to create binaries for Android and iOS. And we can get here a simulation of the environment. So you can get information about your business partners, your blah, 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 something like that. All of this is provided by Glue on Mobile or out of the box. It's like an abiding thing where we have um, out of the box really cool design or thing like that for mobile devices. That's the latest part. And that's all, more or less. So don't want to take more time. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's that it, it, it was a, a bit of, of, of content. Questions? Ah, that's in, that's interesting. Um, we are already working in the next release um, because we already have the JSON objects in our cache. So if we don't have the acknowledge in the other side that those uh, things are, are good, essentially we keep a different status in our database cache. So someone like an, an administrator or something can check, they can fix, maybe they can decide if they want to delete and generate the JSON object or they can modify the JSON object directly and the system can retry that one. And you can define in a system configurator vari variable how many times you want to retry that later on. That, that will be part of the next release. We are already testing, but it's not ready for production. Okay, and, uh, next, the last question from my side. We have a Quite uh, wasn't uh, experience with a similar solution uh, because in IDEM there is an application processor and import processor. Yep. But uh, the, our experience was uh, like a consistency around and uh, so the rest is now for us is easier. Like we talk about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question is uh, the size of the company, let's say, because you are using a lot of technologies like Kafka, a lot of huge technologies which is quite expensive on Amazon, let's say, because they are usually replicated, distributed, so quite expensive. So what you estimate or what is your experience, how it costs to implement uh, all those tools you are using, and what is the cost of the maintenance of the market? I will give you just like an, a simple um, comparison. In this moment, for this demo, within the same virtual machine, I was running um, my uh, ERP, so this is a this virtual machine, it was a 16 gigabyte uh, memory, um, just two processors, and I was managing my item pair instance. Kafka was taking just one gigabyte of okay. those 16s. I understand this, but it's uh, most uh, in the production. Because if you're running production, you need two systems. Yeah, replicas. but what I want to show you is, if you are talking about budget, <coughs> So if you are talking about budget, you have two different uh, scenarios. The simplistic scenario is you can run Kafka in your same virtual environment or any um, container, and you don't need maybe an external. That's the simplistic way. For a more complete environment, what you need to do is um, a fully, um, uh, you need to have like an, a volume analysis about how big would be that Kafka uh, think that you are planning to have. So in this case, it consumes significantly less than a database for sure. Um, you are not spending anything in, in licensing for sure, but in power that I know that is your concern, so which is memory, how much CPU or something like that, you need to perform, uh, uh, in this case, l like an, uh, an assessment per first about how big are your transactions, how many users. Similarly, when you are performing this planning for the, for the ERP in those cases. So depending on those cases, your budget would be smaller or would be bigger. Yeah, but uh, knowledge and the human resources is most expensive than running one Not really. The, with Kafka, Kafka, no, but in this case, no. That's why I clarify it because we are using the sim simple, simple way of Kafka. And that is that simple that a normal junior Java developer with a couple of, of scripts, they can create an instance of Kafka and they can create two topics and you are ready to go. So you don't need a fully certified Kafka administrator that is really expensive or things like that. No. In this case, no. Because we sometimes lose data because the reference <coughs> changes. Like, let's say if you, if you send a product, you need to know the ID of the category mm -hmm. or the key value or UID. 
Yeah, if something changed, then uh, you got error and you need to move to the data or something like that. And uh, our experience was, and a small company, let's say 30 users with one administrator, uh, they cannot, they lose sometimes orders from the web store. So for what we did, we create a queue inside Adempia and we put into the queue the JSONs mm -hmm. and they were able to find the errors. So they fix it error or reporting to the company. Yeah, that's already in our cache. It's, it's a similar approach, but it's kind of <coughs> different implementation. Okay. Thank you for your time.